Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, this talk's kind of a mashup between like what is benchmarking, what do, what should you be doing with benchmarking, what could you be doing with benchmarking, and then kind of sliding through to some code that I wrote to, to get this done at work. So I thought I'd take a look at the history of benchmarking, and it's either cobblers making shoes or possibly land surveyors uh, attempting to gain a uniform information about the height of things above sea level. So straight away you can see it's about something that you want to have happen the same way every time, guaranteed, bar none. Because you want to be able to sell someone a pair of shoes, you don't want that you know, being too big or too small. You need to come up with a way to make that a repeatable process. And any software application is at its core a, a repeatable process. So benchmarking is important to you if you want to make sure that the process is consistent and repeatable. Generally, you do that by some kind of check against a standard, hopefully an objective standard. Fundamentally, it's evaluating performance through measurement. So in this particular chart from the, uh, the fictional marketing department, we've got a, a straightforward measure of how good they are versus how good we are. And what you can see over time is that we used to be terrible and that now we've managed to come, come up close to the, uh, to the competition. So this has really two functions. One is, is that it allows you to see that you're uh, behind the curve according to some particular measure. And the other one is it allows you to justify your pay rises by uh, examining your past performance. So let's take a look at a concrete, concrete example. This doesn't use any of the code that I wrote, uh, but PyPy are very big on benchmarking. In fact, it's a major selling point that they have. And they've uh, hooked in with someone who's building a system for visualizing performance called code speed. They chose to measure speed. They could have focused on memory or network performance, performance or anything else that makes sense for your business. We've lost the mic. Never mind. Okay, so uh, an example of that, like if you're a phone manufacturer, you may have uh, certain uptime guarantees may be more important to you than speed or, or some other metric. So let's take a look straight away at the uh, capacity of, this, of the imagery to tell a story about what's going on here. So the yellow line is normalized C Python performance, and straight away you can see that all of the blue things, apart from the one in the middle, are under the yellow thing. And it doesn't take a whole lot of rocket science to realize that that's actually a substantial performance enhancement over the particular thing that you're, me you're measuring. So you don't need to explain to someone in some complicated fashion that they could potentially move to PyPy if, if they're facing a speed restriction. It really still tells the whole story. You can use benchmarking in a few ways. You could use it to push around the time that your developers are spending and, and the pressures that exist on them. And one of the ways to do that is by introducing something into their feedback loop. If you show them again and again and again that something that they're doing is slower than it needs to be, slower than in the past, they're not really making it a priority, you can bring it up and put pressure into the system. And by pressure, I don't mean making them work an extra four hours a day and, and, and eating, pizzas or e eating pizzas at work instead of having a life. I just mean that you put it front and center in front of them and you say, this thing is important. So to improve performance, measure it. But this makes the selection of your uh, measurement fairly important. So here's an example of why. Uh, you can take a look straight away at PyPy's performance over time. Now, it might be drawing a bit of a long bow to say that this graph is responsible for PyPy's speed enhancements over time, but it shows the consistent application of effort, and arguably you can see that it shows, a, to some extent, a diminishing return as they uh, uh, approximate towards what, uh, what might be around about the limits of what they can easily achieve. But again, it, sell, it sells another kind of important message that these people don't just care about speed now, they've always cared about speed, and they always will care about speed. So if that's an important factor to you, you it sells that message quite effectively as well. A word of warning, you can prove anything with statistics. There, there, there's just lies, damn lies, and statistics, as they say. So you've really got to have a handle on selecting a number when you're making your initial graph. It, it can be really quite important. So what do you compare against? Compar comparison over time is one of the most straightforward kinds of, of comparison you can do, uh, but you do have a lot of other options. For us, configuration is relevant because we deploy to different places which have different amounts of geography involved, so our data sets are very different in particular deployments. So that might be something that's relevant, relevant to your application, 
or you can benchmark by hardware. I don't know if anyone's uh, ever been pulled off their development, uh, development process to go, okay, you take this machine that we've just bought and tell us if it's any good for a week, but it's not a whole lot of fun. If you've got a direct competitor, as you might with open source, have access to their source code, you can do uh, comparison plots, you can take a look at how you're doing compared to how they're doing, and you can share quite a lot of information about what the crunch, part, crunch parts are in each of your applications, and some applications may even have standard trials and tests, obvious ones being like ACID3 test for HTML compliance. You can use benchmarking to notice problems. So instead of it be, uh, speed uh, being ha something that you might have to go and run a specific report for, you can just background it into your build bot and every time it uh, spikes over six, you get an email. So you can, push, you can push it down so that you can just worry about it at the, li at the latest possible minute rather than uh, having, to be, having to be proactive about it. You can, you can push it out of your RAM. So what's the benchmarking of software specifically? You've got to ask what's measurable about software. What should be the basis for comparison and what standards exist? And this will change depending on your industry. But most benchmarking is about speed. Because let's face it, if it works, the only thing you really care about is how fast it is. If you've got something that's sitting there on your phone, on your laptop, and it works like that, that is such a key to you know, user acceptance of what it is that you're doing. People will put up, put up with a lot if it's fast. We've got this uh, application at work that was written by a non-programmer in their off hours that's never been properly transitioned to our IT department. It's completely unsupported, but it is the favourite application of our forecasters. It's not the best, it's not the most powerful, but they just love it the most. And it's because it works just exactly like that. It's just snappy to use. And everyone understands it. It's easy to sell to people. There are other aspects. So, you too can benchmark your Python code. So, there's this thing I wrote. I'd like to share it. Benchmarker.py will collect all of this information for you, and it, it's designed to just work. I think that the biggest gift you can give anyone when programming is to take something and make it really, really easy for someone else to do. So, Benchmarker.py is a tool which measures and reports on execution speed. It's a pretty thin wrapper around C profile. It's not like a work of genius, it's just a work of convenience. It has integration for code speed and your manager will love it. Your mileage may vary. So it's uh, available for a very straightforward installation. Um, you can grab the source. Very easy to follow tutorials. So one of the things that I've got is about four tutorials and I'm gonna try and get through the slides reasonably quickly and we can take a little bit of a look at some of the, the demos that's, pack, that's packaged with it and uh, take a bit of a look at it. Uh, I think it's fairly easy to use. Uh, I, either it's a, a good way to go or the most gratuitous use of a decorator in a presentation, uh, could be either. And uh, the fundamental model is, is what I call test-driven benchmarking. So one of the things that sometimes uh, you might be concerned about is whether you need to have some careful control around the setup and installation of a benchmarking environment. So you might, uh, you might need to do something like, oh wait, I'm heavily network, in network involved. Uh, one of the things you need to do then is like simulate network lag, things like that. All of those are good to, to get right and will contribute towards your numbers and your information being far more correct. But they, they get in the way of the kind of zero, zero hurdle model of starting. So, what I've done isn't anything particularly genius, it's just particularly convenient, because you can just take your existing test suite and just go, give me the numbers. I'm trying to avoid this. Okay, so how do you use it? Well, you import it uh, as a module, then you import uh, a sub-module, which is responsible for the actual collection of the information, and then you import the decorator, and then you just wrap your function around it. So you've got some function, that does something pointless and expensive, and then all you have to do is call it. So you don't need to uh, drop in a specialized execution piece of code to call this function over the top of it. You don't need to write uh, uh, something that sits alongside pi.test to like carefully do cprofile.run calls into these, into these functions and end up duplicating half of your, half of your API into the pro program. You can just drop one of these in. You can drop it into uh, the absolute middle of a piece of your application, just around any function that you decide, hey, I'm interested, I don't know what this call's doing, I think I might just drop a decorator in and see what comes out the other end. 
or you could wrap it around every test function or you could wrap it around the slow test function or a failing test function and it will uh, interpret that, get in the way of the, of the standard uh, call to that function, run it you know, con a configurable number of times. Uh, I accidentally defaulted it to 100. It turns out that really slows down my test suite. Um, so you might want to pick a number like four. You, you don't want to pick one. It's just a thing to watch out for because there's so much uh, invocation time the first time something runs. Often you've got to import a new module that takes more time but subsequent runs are very fast. So you, you generally want to take an average or I'd, you might as well just stick with the sum um, of some number of calls over time. This then basically dumps you out a historical archive to disk. So it's fairly loosely coupled. So step one is build an archive of this stuff out on disk. So one of the things I didn't want to do was end up coupling too many things together in this particular application. And I think that's not a bad rule of thumb for anyone doing like anything at work, open source projects, however it is you like to write code. If you can come up with a, a natural separation point, in this case, uh, the collection of statistics and the doing of something with them, dump that, dump that uh, interface down onto disk as, an, as a historical archive, you can, you can do a lot of interesting things like that. And of course, these pstats objects that come out the other end, they're, they're quite a rich data structure. You can do quite a lot with them. So you've got to choose what to pay attention to. Uh, the, the easiest choices are like whatever you want or everything. But uh, as, you, as you kind of get a bit more sophisticated and you realise, wait, there's actually a whole lot of everything and I don't really know what to pay attention to, you might need to consider what it is that's going to give you your, your best results. There's no just magic answer. Watching the most expensive functions is not a bad idea, but it often turns out that your most expensi expensive functions are already your most highly optimised ones. You can't get around the fact that you've got a 100 gigabyte array that you need to process. You can't get around the fact that you've already pushed this call out to see, and that's as fast as, the, uh, that's as, fast as disk read and writes go. Often those things will dominate your most expensive functions anyway, so you need to do a bit of, have a bit of insight into what it is your program's doing and start start kind of hand rolling this thing and that's sort of where some of the magic comes in about selecting a good set of set of things to be watching but again and this is where that's separated everything gets stored out to the disk and then you can go back and watch something else over history if you want to watch something else over history you get to watch the most common user operations that's a really good way to go when in doubt get user focused pay attention to what your customers want give them what they want and go okay well I'll take these system tests these represent the slowest or the most frequently executed user operations or the most business critical operations or just the things that people love which may actually not even be about your core functionality but they, they might just love the fact that you've got an integrated Twitter client and if that's slow that might hold them back so you, you can do a bit of uh, audience perspective in, in your test suite uh, in your uh, benchmark watch, watch list. Hand, hand select a, a mixture of kind of like inner loop and outer loop things. So you might want to take a look at, you know, how long does my whole test suite take? How long does it take to do some complicated thing? And then just like take a look at some contributory factors to that that might be relatively small but you might want to highly optimise. Critical path functions, uh, if you have a GUI application Watching how fast Qt lays out its dialogues, like, you know, that happens in its own thread. It may not be what's actually slowing that person down whose job it is to do something all day. It might be the 10 minute background task that you've got to go submit to your database. So paying attention to what the critical path is in terms of the user interaction. Uh, these are some numbers from, uh, from work. So this is quite interesting. This is a uh, uh, hybrid Python C system. And these are our most expensive functions and none of them are the Python functions. They're all actually the C functions. So straight away, it's quite interesting because actually I don't really need to benchmark my Python. It turns out what I probably need to do is go upgrade some old crufty C libraries. Almost all of the time is in one place. You often hear about the 80-20 rule. This is the uh, 99 and 98 hundredths to two, two hundredths rule, okay? That means that there were just 12 functions taking 90% of the time out of 6,700 functions. So straight away you just go, I know exactly where to look for what's slow in this particular application. Version control is integrated but primitive. Obviously you want to tie these things back to commits when you can and it's on the way. 
Visualization uh, is uh, done through this code speed interface, but you can do it through Excel. There's a comma separated value exporter, so you can email these things to your manager who can open them in Excel. So there's a demo on there. So I thought I'd grab a few, few real world examples. These are Python implemented sort functions and a Fibonacci, Fibonacci calculator that calculates the Fibonacci of 26. So straight away you get to see uh, your first year university course smiling back at you with uh, bubble sort, insertion sort, uh, merge quick, and uh, where would Python be without a Tim sort that doesn't even register on my graph? Uh, I'm going to uh, probably hurry through to some extent the controlling the environment. Um, I would just, uh, just caution, you don't always know the uh, call-in paths to a function, even if you think you do, so write a particular top-level test that calls it in a particular way and, and you'll uh, avoid a few issues. Try a few things like different, different kinds of data, realistic data. Um, th this again, take a look at total time versus cumulative time. Total time is actually the time that you can make less by making algorithms more efficient. Cumulative time is the sort of thing where you go, I might be wrapping my, my contributing functions up in some bad way. And future directions. I need a, a user base larger than one. Uh, I need to integrate properly with version control. I think I can make the interface even simpler. And there's just, you know, this is really just my to-do list. may not be that interesting. Uh, acknowledgements. I'd like to thank Ed Schofield, who got the code speed integration over the line, uh, Mikel Torres, who developed code speed, and the Bureau of Meteorology for allowing this work to progress as open source. Um, I know I've got only one minute left, but I'm just going to bounce back. Sorry? Oh, five. Awesome. My, uh, my Android is fast. <laughs> um, I'm just going to bounce back, because go having gone through the slides, I really don't think I made enough of what's going on here. Now this thing here is a web application called CodeSpeed that just sits there and it, it draws these graphs. It draws uh, over time graphs and it draws these normalized relative to some baseline graph. And it, it currently runs uh, PyPy. Uh, it gives you comparison over time against CPython. Uh, there's a move on to maybe do the same thing for CPython so that you can get per function uh, graphs. These things are all available over time per function as well. It's quite a powerful application. You could readily use uh, the code I've written to uh, just drop, it, drop a configuration into your PyTest and basically auto-submit what you've already got uh, now. Uh, I think you'd probably get it up in, inside of an hour, maybe two hours. There's a, a fab installer for code speed as part of this, as part of the code base. You just go fab install code speed, sets up an example for you. You do a minimal uh, configuration of your unit test, a minimal configuration of the submission to code speed, and you, you'll have a website running up with a graph inside an hour easy. Um, so look, thanks everyone for their time. Uh, I hope I wasn't too disorganized. Okay, we've got time for a couple of questions. You said it wrapped around the C profile module. Does it have any support for the run snake run um, visualizer? Uh, no. It, should, it, 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 was, it came together very quickly, so I kept it fairly minimal. I'd quite like to put some more features into this thing over the next sort of six months or so. So. I'm curious about how this might fit into a, a larger build bot or continuous integration kind of environment. Have you given some thought to where the, the boundary points in that might be? Yeah, you could pick it up pretty much as is. Say you had Jenkins, you could do a, an on complete. You could easily do um, an execution of your unit tests with this stuff turned on and a specified version tag that came out of your build bot it would drop it into, into that uh, historical disk archive with a version number. And then when, that, when that's enabled, uh, this, the code speed submission will sniff the version number out of the file name and you will get a version history of your, of your speed over time. It will slow down your test suite, so you might want to do it on every 15th commit or nightly instead of every time. Um, and yeah, it's pretty easy to integrate. Yeah. Actually, I, I do have a question for you, which I'll, I'll sneak in the queue here. Um, 
two aspects that one you glossed over and the other you had on the slide, but I don't think you actually mentioned explicitly. I'm sort of intrigued to see how you're handling it. Um, the first one is if you're running on a box where something else is running, uh, you know, you, if you're on a shared machine and someone else kickstarts their massive nightly processing, when you start your benchmarking, your benchmarking data is really quite tainted. Yeah. Is there any protection or coverage against knowing that has happened or reporting that in the data? No, I had a go at looking to see what could potentially be done, um, and there's not an enormous amount. You could maybe virtualize it, um, might be something you could do, but all of the advice from, the, from those who have gone before is to not run it on a machine that's doing anything else at the time. Um, I wish there were a better answer, though. Okay, the second, sort of the other part of it is, um, on the first time you run any body of code, like if you've emptied, here, I've got a selection of PY files, the first time you run it, it compiles and generates all the PYC files, and that essentially right. your first profile run can universally be thrown away, unless you are only ever doing one run and testing that as part of the, uh, the, the profiling process. Um, is there any particular reason that you can or, sh or should include that first run in your averages? Uh, the, well, the answer is probably the default mode for this application should be to throw away the first run, but that's not how it is. It includes the first run. Arguments for why you wouldn't are obvious is that often in operations that's a sunk cost. It's gone. It's just happened when the application started. 90% of the modules got imported, imported, things are ready. The argument for why you might include it is um, if you have dynamic reloading of your Python for any particular reason, you might want to. Maybe your server startup time actually is the thing you're testing. And so you actually want to know about the startup time. So it's about controlling, it's about paying attention to the right things. Um, wait, yeah. wait, is, are, we, are there any hooks or plans to add hooks to flush all the PYC files? So that actually is, does, can be something that you profile specifically as, you know, assume, let's, let's profile this yeah, and assume that we're starting with a clean bench. It's a good idea. It wouldn't take very long to implement. Okay. Yeah. yeah sorry. Um, yeah, so, um, uh, one thing I was thinking about, and you did mention this um, earlier, was um, that if you've got a large application, you really have to pick and choose what it is you really want to profile. So is there an easy way to keep track of what it was that you picked and chosen? Yeah, so when, when you set up the code speed submission thing, you just list functions. And so I, I would encourage people to stick with a list of functions over time, because the meaning of how long those things take won't be apparent the first time you do it. You, you'll need to run that thing for three months before you finally figure out the relationship between what you're watching and what's going on on the desk and what everyone's reactions are. So the, the users might react to something. Having a consistency over time in your reporting to the organization and to your manager is an important part of them understanding what you're telling them. Um, so uh, if you're seriously going to do it, a good amount of initial consideration and then consistency of what you're reporting over time is really important. Um, but this does have the capacity because it stores the historical archive to essentially rerun history and, and resubmit over a different set of functions. Actually, I, I even think you should probably have multiple perspectives that you're watching. You should have like your manager's perspective and your user's perspective and you could actually record, have multiple code speeds for multiple audiences, you know, if you really want to go the whole nine yards. I guess the next, it's almost the opposite question to what you were asking before is uh, ways of running test un under load, under load scenario. So as you said, it's the easiest way is to get a computer that's not doing anything else and test what it is. But the question is, you know, if it's only if you haven't actually got as much memory to run some of these things, whether there's a, a speed difference and things like that. Yeah, I mean, that a lot of that will come into, it, it will not so much be a part of the benchmarking application as it will be a part of your test invocation environment. Um, and there are things that, there is definitely network simulators, for example, that you might want to either plug in as a mock in some of your tests anyway, um, because you want to be testing them anyway. Um, and yeah, you, there's just so many levels of sophistication. The idea behind this is that you can take your existing code base and for the cost of 30 lines of code, get graphs inside of an hour. Um, and then that extra sophistication would probably come into test configuration rather than this code base. Uh, one of the problems in Python web applications is that people do benchmarks but the applications aren't real data. And so when you move into production, it's a totally different picture because yeah. you just don't get the same behavior. Do you find that sort of, sort of problem in what you're doing and that you'll do benchmarks and unit testing, but then reality when you're actually in the real app, it's totally different? Uh, 
Well, uh, just for historical reasons, we don't get bitten by that particular thing. Um, but I think it's generally important to realize that unit testing isn't just the answer to everything. And you actually need some system tests and smoke tests to go along with it. And the system tests should actually be realistic, as should the smoke tests. Um, and then those things will give you performance numbers that are closer to your production environment. Um, yeah, if you've never tested how your code works in a production environment and you deploy it to production, I think that's bad. So I, I just think it's important to have stages of testing. Any more questions? <clears throat> All right. Uh, thank you very much, Tennessee. Everybody. Thank you.